name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I have said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I invite the congregation in to please kneel. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray to you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon then this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. Instead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Like the congregation in the please stay. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my sin, and cleanse me from all my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated then as we sing our Lenten hymn, hymn 419, Savior, Wind, and Dust to Thee.
This time then we'll have the imposition of ashes for those who desire to come and receive the sign of the cross. We'll, we'll do this in sections here in the pew, so we'll start with this side, and then you'll make your way down the middle, and then return back here to the side, and we'll just go to this section. Same thing, coming down the middle, return to the side, then this section coming down the middle, return to the side, the far wing over here, and then the choir loft will be the last to come forward, and then go down one of the side aisles after they receive the imposition of ashes. So we'll start then here with the section, and we'll move from the forward then to the back of each section. We stand in for prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you despise nothing you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and contrite hearts that lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, we may receive from you full pardon and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated then for our readings. Old Testament reading then from Ash Wednesday, or Ash Wednesday, that is taken from the prophet Joel, the second chapter. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your hearts, and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, 
Call a solemn assembly, gather the people. Consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room in the bride or chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. And I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is taken from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, the fifth chapter. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. sermon then here this evening. St. Mark writes, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. 
And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We confess then the Christian faith with the words the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world of time. Amen. You be seated then as we sing our hymn of the day, hymn 424.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to all of you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Matthew and Luke begin their Gospels with Christmas, with the birth, birth of the Savior, and at least with a little bit of his childhood, but not Mark. There's no baby Jesus there in the manger. There's no angels. There's no shepherds. There's no wise men. There's no flight to Egypt. There's no boy Jesus there in the temple. There's none of that. Mark sends us hurtling right out of the starter's block in his gospel with the beginning of Christ's earthly ministry. We meet John the Baptist here in Mark chapter 1, but not with all the detail and the backstory that Luke provides in his gospel. No, we just meet John doing what John does. Mark writes, and John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. What's John doing out there in the wilderness? Baptizing. And proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of your sins. Hmm. Repentance. Who needs to repent? Who needs to have sins forgiven? Well, the innocent, they don't need to repent. The innocent, they don't need any forgiveness. Sinners need to repent. Sinners need forgiveness. And what do they need to repent of? What do they need forgiven? Well, sin. Original sin and actual sin. Original sin, well, that's just who we are. As we confess here tonight in the liturgy. We are poor, miserable sinners. And actual sin, well, that's the stuff that sinners actually do in their thoughts, words, and deeds. That's why sinners need to repent. That's why they need a wash, a bath. That's why they need to be baptized. That's why Ananias will tell Saul, who later becomes Paul in the book of Acts, to rise, be baptized, and wash away your sins. But wait a minute here. Let's, let's just hold the phone here for a second. Mark told us here tonight that Jesus came to be baptized. He came to John for baptism. That baptism. A sinner's baptism. Now why on earth would Jesus do that? If you're thinking here tonight, Jesus doesn't have any of his own sin, so why, why is he coming to be baptized? Well, St. Paul answered that question for us here tonight in our epistle reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, right there at the end of our reading here tonight, where Paul says, God made Jesus, who had no sin of his own, to become the sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus isn't stepping into the Jordan River to have his sins washed away. No, he's stepping into the Jordan River to have all of the sins that have been washed off of us washed now onto Him. And so tonight in Mark's Gospel, we find our Savior knee-deep in the Jordan River. In the midst of all that filth, in the midst of all those trespasses and iniquities, we find Him there knee-deep in all that stuff, and He's soaking all that sin up like a sponge. Fulfilling all righteousness for us. For us sinners. And what happens next? Well, immediately, Mark tells us, the Father and the Spirit, they arrive on the scene. And the Father preaches a very short sermon. I mean, it's a real short one. But it's a very important one. One that the whole world needs to hear. And yet, the Father isn't speaking that sermon to those who are gathered there at the banks of the Jordan River. He's not speaking that sermon to you here tonight, and he's not speaking it to the rest of the world. He's actually speaking this sermon to his son, who now is beginning the race to the cross. Because if you know anything about the Old Testament, the sacrificial system, you know that before the sacrifice is sacrificed, the sacrifice is washed. 
And Jesus now is going to be the ultimate sacrifice. And he's now set on this course, on this race now in Mark's gospel, that's going to get him to the cross as quickly as he can get there. And so the father says to his son, you are my beloved son. Because you're doing this, I am well pleased with you. <coughs> now there's a joke that Lutheran pastors like to tell from time to time, and it goes like this. There was a town down south, way down south, where there was a local Baptist church that was putting on this huge revival. And with great fanfare, the preacher had gathered everybody up down by the riverbank under the bridge near downtown. And it just so happened that a man was walking across that bridge who had had a little bit too much to drink. And as he stumbled over the bridge, there over the river, the, the preacher down below at the riverbank spotted him and he yelled out, Brother, have you found Jesus? The man was pretty confused, and he responded to the preacher, No, I haven't. Well, that preacher summoned him to come down off the bridge, come down to the riverbank, come down to the water, and once he got down there, the preacher dumped him right under the water. So when now the wet victim arose out of the water and finally regained his senses, the preacher asked him the same question once again, Brother, have you found Jesus? And the man answered once again, well, no, I haven't. So the preacher dumped him two more times under the water. And when the man finally came up and got all the water off of his face and knew what was going on, the preacher asked him for the last time, brother, have you found Jesus? Well, the man was very confused at this point. He was getting a little frustrated. And he said, reverend, I've been down there three times, and I didn't see Jesus. Are you sure he fell in here? <laughs> now, why did I tell this joke? Well, number one, I do think it is kind of funny. But more importantly, I think it serves as a very helpful reminder that Jesus is, in fact, in the waters of holy baptism. Not just in his own here today in our gospel reading, but he's actually there in yours. As Jesus descended there into the Jordan River to begin his race to the cross as the sacrifice, as the sin bearer of the whole world, now soaking up all of your sin, so now he still descends into the waters of holy baptism to soak up your sin. He comes to you in your baptism, to forgive you all of your sins. Because in baptism, St. Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 6 that we're baptized into Christ's death and into His resurrection. His race to the cross now is your race. You've died. You've risen with the crucified and resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Your sins truly are forgiven. But what happens after Jesus is baptized? Well, the irony of it all is that what happens to Jesus after he's baptized is exactly the same thing that happens to you after you're baptized. Mark writes, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And this is an interesting picture in the Greek. The word that's used there is ekbalo, where we get the English word ball, and ek is out. Kind of like throwing a ball. What the Holy Spirit does is basically take Jesus by the collar and throws him now out into the wilderness to face Satan. And Mark writes, he's in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. Well, that's kind of interesting here to know. What does that mean? What does it mean for you? It means that the waters of holy baptism actually bring with it temptation. Why would that be the case? Well, think about it here tonight. It's real simple. The devil doesn't work on his own people. He's a, he's a pretty good HR guy. I mean, that would be kind of a, a lousy application and allocation of his resources. He doesn't work on his own people. He's already got them. He works on the baptized. 
Being a baptized Christian actually puts a bullseye right here in the middle of your chest. Being a baptized Christian means that you've got a magnet now that's automatically going to draw the attention of the evil one. Why? It's because you've got Jesus. You've got the Savior. The Savior from sin. And that really ticks off Satan. He's honked off because you've got the only person who can actually do anything about temptation, sin, and death. Because Mark tells us tonight, Jesus immediately went from his baptism to temptation. From the Jordan to the wilderness. And he went armed ex exactly as we are armed. With nothing but the promises and the word of God. But the outcome of those temptations for Jesus is a little bit different than it is for us. The writer of the Hebrews reminds us that Jesus was tempted in every single way that we are, but, and it's a very important one, but he did not sin. And if you understand that right out of the gate, you're understanding a big point here of the rest of the Gospel of Mark. Because you're going to understand that one of the huge points that Mark is going to stress for the rest of his Gospel, for the rest of the book, is this. Jesus has already defeated the devil. He's already outdueled that old wily foe. And he's done it all for you. As the second Adam, as the second man, as the new creation. He's done it all for you. And then for you too, which is the rest of the Gospel of Mark, he's begun this race to the cross. And along the way, which is what you're going to find in the rest of Mark's Gospel, along the way, Satan's going to throw one problem after another in front of Jesus. It's going to try to trip him up, but none of it works. What do you get, demons? Sin, sickness, suffering, storms, hunger, pain, rejection, death. But none of it takes Jesus out of the race. Jesus doesn't give up until he finally gets to the cross and he cries out, it is finished. And he does it all with a very gracious call. But yet a very urgent one as well. We heard that call here tonight as he starts the race. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come. Repent. You were running that way in your life. Away from the cross. So do a U-turn. Come back now and start running toward the cross once again. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe that good news. And then he concludes our text here tonight as he calls his disciples by saying, Come, follow me. You're invited now to join Jesus on this race to the cross. And we will join him, especially over the next six weeks. And as we start this race to the cross with him, we're going to run into all sorts of fellow sinners along the way. And we'll run into a few here next Wednesday night. And along the way, as we race, we're going to have to stop, as racers do, for a little water. We're going to have a water break. We're going to ponder some things. We're going to get baptismal. And we're going to drown all of those sins that the Lord is going to forgive along the way. And we're going to rise again to new life with those that he restores along the way to the cross. Oh, we're not going to have time to take in every vista on this race. We're not going to have time here over the next six weeks to stop and talk to every sinner along the way. But you're going to get to know some of the sinners. You're going to get to know personally some of the sinners that the Lord meets on the way to the cross. And you'll begin to understand many of the blessings that the Lord bestows on sinners. So remember, the 
The race to the cross has begun. The time is short. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Believe the good news. And come follow him. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds and faith in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. I invite the congregation then to stand for prayer. Friends in Christ, I urge you all to lift up your hearts to God and pray with me as Christ our Lord has taught us and freely promised to hear us. God our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name may be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith, that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we commend all who are in need, praying for them at all times. Thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Grant us our daily bread, preserve us from greed and selfish cares, and help us trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you. And that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world in its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wives. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, deliver us from all evil of both body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue then with the service of the sacrament, beginning there with the preface. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Grant us your spirit, gracious Father, that we may give heed to the testament of your Son in true faith, and above all, firmly take to heart the words with which Christ gives to us in his body and blood for our forgiveness. By your grace, lead us to remember and give thanks for the boundless love which you manifested to us, when by pouring out his precious blood, he saved us from your righteous wrath and from sin, death, and hell. Grant that we may receive the bread and wine that is his body and blood as a gift, guarantee and pledge of his salvation. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. 
The same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. You stand for prayer. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you, and fervent love toward one another. For Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome everyone this evening once again here in the name of the Lord as we've started our journey here to the cross. The race has begun as Jesus has said now. The kingdom of God is here because the king is here. The good news is here. Repent and believe it. And we're going to join him here over the remaining five weeks and then all throughout Holy Week, all the way up to Easter to the empty tomb. We're going to join him on this race to the cross and then out of the empty tomb. And we're going to grow a lot here in what it means to pick up our cross, follow him, and there see the real reason for why Jesus was born, why he came and what he's come to do for us. So we invite you to be here next week. We'll have a dinner next week as we'll start the next five weeks of dinners here. So next Wednesday night we'll eat at 6. Worship will be at 7. There's sign-up sheets out there in the hallway uh, if you'd like to help out there outside of Sonia's office, or secretary's office. So if you'd like to sign up to, to help out with those dinners, that would be great. But it's a wonderful time to come have some fellowship and, and a meal here and then get ready to come to church as we'll continue here on this race, on this journey here that will get us to Good Friday and to Easter. So have a good evening, good rest of your week here as we begin now the 40 days of Lent. We invite you to be back here next Wednesday and then also Sunday as we'll see Jesus out there in the wilderness and we'll just get a chance to see what that exactly all means as well for Jesus and us and that'll be the focus of our sermon then on Sunday as we look at the temptation of our Lord. And we'll conclude our worship then here this evening with our closing hymn as we'll sing hymn 875, Abide With Me.